rather than feeling like you have to strain that big, beautiful brain of yours to come up with ideas, you can literally snatch them from all around you. If I'm miserable, if I'm upset, if I'm angry, if I'm cranky, it is my responsibility because it's based on what I'm thinking or believing in that moment. I work so hard to get my business off the ground and I was often working seven days a week. Top 10, I got a top 10. Got my motivation high for my top 10. Gotta learn from the wise women and men. All my life, like nine out of nine. For my top 10, top 10, top 10, nine out of nine. This one's for my top 10. Need motivation? Watch a Todd Tan with We Believe Nation. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and this channel was created to help you overcome the number one challenge that is holding you back, a lack of belief in yourself. You watch these videos because you know there's something more inside you too. You have Michael Jordan level talent at something. So get ready to listen to your gut, start before you're ready, and track your successes with Marie Forleo and my take on her top 50 rules for success to give you the confidence, motivation, and belief that you need. Enjoy. Okay, let's kick it off with rule number one. Find your path. You know, my first gig out of college was on Wall Street, on the New York Stock Exchange. This and is pre This is pre-everything. This is like just out of college, 21 years old, and I knew um, one of my drives, I wanted to be really successful, but not just to like get shoes. I knew I wanted to make money because I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to be able to take care of my family. I wanted to be able to contribute to causes that I believe in. And so I knew in order to do that in my own mind, I was like, well, I want to make a lot of money and make this stuff happen. But when I was on Wall Street, even though so many people that I worked with uh, multi, multi millionaires, I mean, the money was ridiculous. While they were financially rich, they were spiritually bankrupt. And I felt like there was a part of me that was dying inside. And I said, this is not my path. I don't know what my path is, but I need to leave this because I feel sick. And so I think many people feel like that. You can find yourself in job and job and job, and you want to do, really, do great work in the world. You're giving it your best, but some little voice inside is saying, this isn't me. This isn't me. And I kept having that voice until finally I left the corporate world and started my own business. Rule number two, listen to your gut. Listen to your gut and your heart because no matter what any expert tells you, your wisdom inside needs to be paramount. It needs to always drive all of your decisions. Even you know when I was first starting out and I would pay attention to people that absolutely knew what they were doing, they were completely ethical, they were smart, they were good teachers as well. Sometimes their advice just didn't sit right with me. And if I wasn't as secure in my own inner voice, I might have gone down paths that wouldn't have been that great. So I think it's wonderful to get an education, it's wonderful to take in experiences, but never, ever, ever listen to anything other than what is the true voice within you. And that takes practice. Rule number three, be fully engaged. When I was bartending, I was fully bartending. Like I wasn't talking to myself about, oh my God, I should be dancing right now or I should be working on my coaching practice. I was just really into bartending. Mm. And when I was dancing, I was like, you know, being the best hip hop teacher, dancer I could possibly be. When I was being a coach, same kind of thing. And I think that practice of being fully engaged in the thing that you're doing conserves a ton of energy and that's what most people don't do. Rule number four, live in the moment. Part of what was also challenging for me when I was starting off as a coach was um, recognizing the truth that I didn't just want to be a coach. I loved writing. Uh, I loved hip hop. I loved dance. I loved fitness. There were all these different things that I was passionate about. And while I was growing my personal coaching practice, I kept feeling conflicted because I didn't want to just be one thing. Has anyone ever felt that way? <laughs> yeah. So uh, I would listen to the voices in my head, which were like, and basically the voices in my head were so trained by traditional wisdom and traditional thoughts about you have to pick a niche, you have to narrow down, you have to choose one thing and be good for it, be, um, be really good at it, and that's how you'll be known. And when I realized that that voice wasn't the voice I should listen to, that there was this truth that I was this multi-passionate person and that living in the present moment, which Eckhart teaches, was all about um, really listening to your own inner guidance and being in the here and now and not stressing so much up here, that really opened the door for me to say, you know what, screw it. 
I'm going to go take dance classes. I'm going to go learn about this. I'm going to do all these different things. And it, that training to be in the moment and to listen to my own inner guidance allowed me to disconnect from all the BS voices in my head that were torturing me, right. torturing me. Also, if you want to have more confidence, check out my 254 series. They're free. The link to join on the description below. When I was bartending, I was fully bartending. Like I wasn't talking to myself about, oh my God, I should be dancing right now or I should be working on my coaching practice. Because being a really, really good listener is one of the most underrated secrets to success. Rule number five, behave like you're the best. How would you behave if you were the best in the world at what you do? How would that change what time you wake up in the morning? How would that change the food you put in your body? How would that change the people you hang out with? How you spend your time throughout the day? What websites you visit? Whether or not you work from a schedule? If you were world class and the best in the world at what you do, how would your behavior change? It's a really interesting question that I started asking myself a few years ago, and I will tell you it has changed everything. It's one of those singular questions, whether you put it on your screensaver, you have a little reminder on your cell phone, you have it on the top of a notebook, I guarantee you, if you start looking at your world through this lens, it's gonna shift everything. Now let me ask you this, just to back this up a little bit more. Are you guys here because you wanna be mediocre? Mediocre sucks, does it not? Yes. We wanna be world class, we wanna be the best. And let me ask you this, who's in charge of you being the best in the world? Yes? Can I hear an I am? I am. A little louder? I am. One more? I am. Amen, and it's not even a Sunday. Okay, good. Rule number six, define success for yourself. If I had to give someone who's recently graduating from our program a piece of advice, what would you say? I would say to learn and to execute on your unique vision. Define success for yourself. Figure out what that means to you. Don't get taken over by the world's definition of success or your family's or what your friends are doing or what anyone says that equals success, once you can get clear on that vision, then you need to create a plan to make that come to life and to prioritize. I think one of the biggest tragedies of our time is I hear so many people from every walk of life, health coaches all over, feeling so overwhelmed and overworked and there's so much that they can do that they feel paralyzed. Well, I don't know what to do first or what, how do I I make all of this happen and I think that we all need to take a few steps back and start to get clear on our own vision for success and then actually prioritize making that come to life because then it gives you such clarity and such freedom and all of that static and the overwhelm starts to fall away. Rule number seven, be okay with uncertainty. What if I actually follow my heart and I don't make a living at it and all my friends say you suck, see I told you so. Uh, Eckhart actually talked about when he was moving once, his parents said, really, you're going to do this again? Like, they'd seen him as a failure for years, and then, anyways, but there's that, always that voice. It's like, yeah, 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 but you might just really fail. Yeah, and you know, I think all of us have that, and there's perhaps some of them, like a myth that many of us can think, especially when we're first starting out, that successful people don't have the voice anymore. That's total crap. <laughs> anyone that you've ever seen, anyone that I've encountered, and I've had the opportunity to interview a lot of people and talk to them, no matter how successful, how accomplished, how well known, they still have those voices of self-doubt. They still get afraid. They still question, am I going in the right direction? What's next for me? And I think the more that we can recognize that that voice of basically you suck is universal, and we can disengage from that and actually engage with what we want in our lives, the happier we're gonna be. And this is the other thing, none of us know. It's like everything that I've learned and I've been able to do in my business, we never know what's gonna work. We treat every single thing as an experiment. That's the only way that you learn. I think 99% of what each of us need to do to learn and grow, not only as business people, but also as human beings, if we're gonna grow, it means that we've never done that before. It's gonna be uncomfortable. And to be okay in that uncertainty and that discomfort is where the juice of life lives. Rule number eight, take action. I really went into pursuing different passions with eyes wide open, meaning knowing because my focus was split, I probably wouldn't be getting very far in any of them, mm -hmm. but I made a conscious choice that I just wanted to experience them. 
Mm -hmm. I wanted to understand them from the inside out. I spent so much time thinking in my mind, is this the right choice for me? Is this the right career for me? Should I try and build a business around this? And I said, that's such a dumb way to go around it. Like you should just engage and experience and actually get your foot in the industry. That can inform whether or not you should move ahead. About someone who's stuck or struggling, what would you tell them? Stuck or struggling is, is typically someone who is more engaged in their thoughts than actually taking action. So <laughs> it's a really interesting, subtle shift. But if you catch yourself complaining like, oh, I'm so stuck and stop, yeah. write an email, make a call, take a step. And the more you actually do that and catch yourself, we actually, um, sorry, this is me, ADD. I, my toes are exactly that color. Awesome. Yes. I love it. Bing. <laughs> um, but it is, it's really a practice of checking in with yourself. You got to check yourself before you wreck yourself. Like stop complaining, stop talking to yourself in your head and do something. Rule number nine, express yourself. I have been this way, meaning goofy, silly, since I was very, very little. And when I first started my coaching practice when I was 23, I tried to be what I thought in my mind was a businesswoman. I had this idea of like a power suit and some like big old shoulder pads and I would speak in a certain way. And I remember trying to do that and I felt horrible. Like I felt so stunted. It was like I had writer's block, I had speaker's block. I just felt like I was in somebody else's skin and it was so painful for me that I was just like, I can't do this. But I really wanna do this thing. I'm gonna let go of my idea of who I think I should be and talk about the fact I'm from Jersey. I don't use proper language all the time. <laughs> I have kind of a weird sense of humor. I love zombies, Smurfs, all kinds of things. And what would happen if I actually just expressed that? And something funny actually did happen is not only did I find myself to be more creative, I found myself more fulfilled and people actually connected with me more. I didn't feel like I had to push myself out into the world. It was more like things started to come to me. And I didn't feel like there was so much of a separation between my work day and the rest of my life, which felt great. Rule number 10, live a good life. For me, a good life is a couple things. One, being fully present in each moment, because I find that when I am fully present, like, you know, you and I having this great conversation now, or if I'm with Josh and we're just hanging out, it does not matter what we're doing, but I feel so peaceful and content and like all is well in the world. Even if there's challenges, I feel a sense of um, peace. And that's one component of it. And I think the other component for me of living a good life is, is having good friends and having a lot of fun. I think any time that I slip into um, taking things too seriously, you know, like I don't know, you walk around your day and you're like, wow, I have so many things to do. And I'm like, wait a minute. This is all awesome stuff to do. And I set my life up this way. I better not take it so seriously and have a little fun and put on some music and dance. When that kind of thread of celebration and irreverence and not taking things too seriously, that's what living a good life feels like to me. Rule number 11, start before you're ready. There's a single mantra that has helped me my entire life bypass fear and make really any dream I've had come true, no matter how scary it seemed, no matter how intimidating it was, or how unprepared or inexperienced I felt. And that mantra is this. You ready for it? Start before you're ready. I'm going to say that again. Start before you're ready. If you wait until you feel ready to do anything meaningful, you're going to be waiting for the rest of your life. Look, I have been doing this for a long time now. I've supported tens of thousands of entrepreneurs to start and grow their businesses across 160 industries and across 119 countries, and I've noticed some similarities. Among the people who are the most successful, the happiest, the people who are actually contributing the most, they all have one thing in common, and it's this. They all start before they're ready. You see, I think you've misidentified the enemy here because the enemy, it's not making mistakes. It's not changing your mind. And the enemy is not your fear. The only enemy that you need to defeat, my friend, is not getting started. This is what most of us just fail to realize. Action is the antidote to fear. Action creates progress and momentum. And action, consistent action, is all you ever need to make anything happen in your life. Rule number 12, follow your fear. 
You know, it seems like you can't open a book or read a blog post these days without hearing somebody tell you to follow your passion or follow your bliss or follow your heart. And yes, I have said those things too. But today I want to talk about the power of going in what can often feel like the opposite direction. I want to talk about the power of following your fear. I'm not talking about following your very useful fear of big moving vehicles and walking in front of a bus, nor am I talking about doing anything stupid or irresponsible that could ruin you financially. What I am talking about, though, is the power of following good fear, directive fear, the kind of fear that you feel when you have an idea that just won't leave you alone, an idea about doing something that you've always wanted to do, something that's different and bold and kind of risky where part of you is saying, oh no, I actually couldn't do that. But the deeper, wiser part of you wants this thing so damn bad. And the moment you imagine yourself going for it, you have worries like, you know, will people laugh at me? Will they ignore me? Maybe this isn't even really an idea. What if I do it and it sucks? Am I going to destroy my reputation? Am I going to lose my marriage and my family and wind up living on the streets? My friend Stephen Pressfield talks about this kind of fear in The War of Art, and he says, Remember our rule of thumb. The more scared we are of a work or calling, the more sure we can be that we have to do it. And he continues, The more fear we feel about a specific enterprise, the more certain we can be that that enterprise is important to us and the growth of our soul. Rule number 13, don't give away your power. Number three is don't give away your power. So anytime some nasty criticism or BS comes your way, you have to say this, you cannot take me down, I will not give you that power. I want you to make that your new mantra in life. You gotta realize that people can say whatever they want, but you do not have to take it in and you don't have to let it ruin your day. Your time on this earth is so precious and it's really, really important that you protect your soul. Rule number 14, have patience. Now, a mistake I notice a lot of folks making, especially in the beginning, is they want instant results. They want these blockbuster hits, like a bajillion followers on social media or millions of dollars in sales after only a few years or maybe even a few months worth of work. I gotta say, patience is one of the most underrated traits in modern business. Do not try and run before you can walk. You gotta take pride in starting small and scrappy, and we try and operate small and scrappy to this day. You've got to be consistent in what you do. You have to be relentless. And most important, this is the thing, you need to write this down. Work your tail off to make your product effing outstanding over the long term. Rule number 15, be hungry. I don't think that anyone should ever accept where they're at in life. doesn't matter if you're just starting out or if you've already hit some really big goals. Because when you lose your hunger, you lose your edge. And it is as simple as that. Now, here's the deal. If we humans don't have something meaningful and challenging to work on, we all tend to get lost pretty darn fast. And I'll tell you something else. We can go to some pretty dark places. At least I know that's true for me. So there is some nuance to this, and it's really important that you get it. So you can be 10,000% grateful for what you have right now. You can uh, smell the roses, so to speak. And you can be super hungry and psyched about what's coming up next. Those two things are not mutually exclusive, and it's really important that you get that fact in your noggin. Rule number 16, fend off negativity. Every single one of us who both dreams and creates things faces voices of dissent, both from people that we know, from people that we don't know, and very often the most deadly comes from within. And if we don't take a thoughtful, conscious approach to taking on our unrealistic dreams, they just ain't gonna happen. I want you to fend off negativity as much as humanly possible. You know, we know so much more about the brain than we did just 20 years ago. Neuroscience has taught us incredible things, like that our brains are continuously shaped by our thoughts and our experiences. And you know this to be true. I mean, negativity is one of the most toxic 
forces on the planet. It's toxic for your brain, for your nervous system, and for your ability to stay motivated. So do me this favor, okay? Do not solicit or listen to the opinions of people who are notorious for just being Debbie Downers. The one mistake that I've seen people make consistently is they almost habitually talk to the exact person who is the most likely to shoot them down and make them feel like crap. So don't do that. And here's another key. I want you to always, always, always consider the source. Meaning, don't put a lot of stock into other people's opinions unless they're actually out there consistently taking risks and being brave and actually making things happen. I mean, if you think about it, let's say, I don't know, you wanted to climb Mount Everest. Would you ever take advice from someone who's never even attempted the summit? No, of course not. That would be crazy. So don't take advice from anyone unless you really think it through. And I want you to ask, has this person achieved an unrealistic or impossible dream? Are they taking meaningful risks on a consistent basis? Do you admire who they are, how they live, and what they contribute? If not, do not use them as a sounding board for your idea. Rule number 17, be boldly not for everyone. Be boldly not for everyone. So what does that mean? So sales prevention is this beautiful thing in business. And sales prevention is when you proactively tell people, do not buy my product, do not buy my program. You might be asking yourself why. Here's why. Because not every product is right for everyone. And that's true no matter how great you think you or your product or your service is. Because you cannot and will not please every person. So you really want to take that fact and use it to your advantage. You want to focus on attracting your ideal customers and really repelling the rest. So for instance, in B-School, here's what I tell people. If you want to learn how to raise money from venture capitalists, we're not for you. Want to know why? Because we don't cover that. If you're looking for an easy button to press and then bam, money starts shooting out of your laptop, we're not for you. You know why? Because that's not how a real business works, people. And if you think that you already know everything there is to know about list building and online marketing and how to sell with integrity, we're not for you. Because you know why? If you already got all the customers and all the integrity you'll ever need, keep your dollars, because I have too much integrity to take them from you. Bottom line is this, when you are boldly not for everyone, you're gonna attract way more of the people that you are right for. And that, my friend, is the formula for creating raving fans. That's the secret to making your business a real joy to run. And when that happens, you know what starts shooting out of your laptop? No, not money. Integrity rainbows. Rule number 18, increase your productivity. We're living in a time when we are allowing our brains to be trained to underperform. We've become addicted to checking our phones, right? To social media and all kinds of stuff. And in doing so, we are reducing our ability to stay focused and do the deep, important work that we're meant to do in this world. Now, what I'm about to suggest isn't complicated and it is not time consuming, but it will require you to take back control of your time, take back control of this beautiful brain and trust that your world will not immediately fall apart if you don't immediately respond to every ding or every buzz or every question or every request. Put your entire life on airplane mode. So don't try and ignore your phone or ignore the emails or ignore the Slack messages or whatever else that you have that dings and rings and pops up. That's like me telling Kuma to ignore this slice of salami. Ain't gonna happen. Who can ignore the salami? Who can ignore the salami? So rather than resist temptation, just eliminate it. And that means you have to put your entire life on airplane mode. Now, obviously, turn off all the notifications. So close all the tabs, close all the windows, turn off the apps. And especially for your phone, I suggest just turning the damn thing off. However, you also got to shut off some people too. And that means that you might have to tell your kids and your spouse and your coworkers that for the next two hours or one hour or three hours that you don't exist. Kind of like this. See, nobody here. Rule number 19, put things in perspective. 
Anything that you're going through right now, um, if you want to take a big scary leap and you want to start a new career or perhaps start a business, anything that you might consider a failure is really just a necessary step on your journey to success. So no matter what you're facing right now, no matter what's getting you so scared, there's only one question that you need to ask and answer to find the courage to make that big leap and the question is this. What's the worst thing that can happen? So not just by saying yes, but what's the worst thing that could happen if you said no? So for example, a few years ago, I asked my really dear friend, Laura, to come speak at one of our live events. Now this was a big opportunity for her, but I know it was kind of stressful. And I said, you know what, um, this is big. So take a few days, think about it, because once you say yes, you're gonna be locked in. So first she had to ask herself, well, what's the worst thing that could happen if I said yes? So for her, it was the stress. It was wishing that she never committed, which she wished she never committed. But it was also this fear that she was gonna completely freeze up on stage, that she was going to mess up horribly and completely ruin her reputation, which she did not. Now on the flip side, she had to ask herself, what's the worst thing that could happen if she said no? So you got to get that Laura really wanted to grow her business and her brand. And if she said no to this opportunity, she'd have to face herself in the mirror every single day and say, nice going bonehead. You had the perfect opportunity to grow your business and you turned it down. So now it's your turn. I want you to ask yourself, what's the worst possible thing that could happen if you said yes and you'd fail miserably? So don't just think about this loosely. I want you to get really specific and tease out every single scenario that could possibly go wrong and how you deal with it if it did. What most of us discover is that no matter what the worst case scenario is, we can actually handle it. But don't forget, you gotta go on the flip side too and ask yourself, what's the worst thing that could happen if you decide to do nothing and keep your life exactly as it is? Are your regrets gonna start to pile up like pancakes? Are you gonna turn into some miserable, self-loathing sad sack? I really want you to tease this one out and get all the scenarios on the table and then take a look. What do you got? What's the worst of the worst? Going for it? are not going for it. Rule number 20, move and meditate. I've been through a series of traumatic events and suffer from depression. I live in Iraq and my country has been in war for decades. I'm an architect and love my job. But here, everything you care about or build can be destroyed at any moment. That's if you manage to survive. So here's my cue. How can I find the courage to continue building knowing all my hard work can be wiped away due to circumstances I can't control. You know, right now I'm in New York and it's hard to fathom the fear and turmoil and uncertainty that you experience on a daily basis. My heart goes out to you and I want you to know that we are sending you love and my hope is that something we share today can help you feel supported and find a sense of strength. You mentioned something really, really important when you talked about Finding the courage in the midst of circumstances you can't control. That's the operative phrase. Circumstances you can't control. You're living an amplified version of that, but you're 100% right. For all of us, so much of what happens in life is completely beyond our control, and that can leave us feeling powerless. But here's the good news. There's one thing that we have just a smidget of control over, and that's ourselves and how we choose to direct our thoughts and our words and our actions. Keeping this in mind, when I read your question, there were two key habits that I wanted to recommend for you. Both of these can be done anywhere. They don't cost anything, and they're both scientifically proven to help improve depression and anxiety and the impact of trauma. Habit number one, daily meditation. So meditation is the ultimate technology for creating peace from the inside out. For me, it's what helps me stay connected to the loving and strong parts of myself and observe my circumstances without getting swept away by them. Habit number two is movement. Now, what's tough about this one is that when we feel depressed or we're under extreme mental anxiety, we don't feel motivated to do much of anything besides maybe eating some chips, or in my case, you're really craving some mac and cheese. However, 
exercise is scientifically proven to be especially effective for depression. You don't even have to get fancy. You don't have to go to a gym. You could run or you could work out in your house. You know, there are a ton of free videos on YouTube that just use your body weight. So you don't even need any equipment. Rule number 21, take responsibility. I try and play this practice of, you know, if I ever feel like in any moment life is not going the way that I think it should be going, it's because I'm resisting what is. You know, if someone didn't turn in their work on time and I'm just like, you know, getting that way or something didn't come out right or the delivery doesn't come or the technology breaks again, we can list anything in that slot, right? It's me arguing with reality. I'm making myself miserable in that moment because I'm choosing to argue with what is. That's always a losing proposition. So the more awareness I can bring to that and go like, is this really how you want to live your life in this moment, Marie? Because every single moment, as you know, sets you up for the next moment. And you string these moments together and guess what? You have your life until we get to that incredible deathbed. We never know when that's coming. So every single moment is an opportunity for us to check ourselves before we wreck ourselves. And so I just try and play the game. If I'm miserable, if I'm upset, if I'm angry, if I'm cranky, it is my responsibility because it's based on what I'm thinking or believing in that moment. It's not the outside world causing me to feel this. It's what I'm doing up here that's making me have that reaction. And if I'm the problem, I am also the solution. Rule number 22, create a minimal viable action. Whether you run a business, a nonprofit, or you just want to be more effective in getting people to say yes, I think you're going to find this fascinating. Dr. Robert Cialdini, author of the classic book on persuasion called Influenced, studied the donations process at the American Cancer Society. He found that the number one game changer in gaining more donations was one tiny language tweak. Let's have a look. Which one of these might make you more likely to donate? Would you be willing to help by giving a donation? Or would you be willing to help by giving a donation? Every penny will help. Now check this out. Research showed that people who were asked the second version were almost twice as likely to make a donation. While only 28% gave money with the first call to action, 50% donated when the call to action included that one extra sentence, every penny will help. So let's break this down. You see, when you give people a small, easy action to take, it can double their chances of saying yes. By adding a simple sentence, you're creating what's known as a minimum viable action, the smallest possible action someone could take to create the change you want. Now, obviously, this doesn't just work for nonprofits. In fact, you've probably been offered a minimum viable action at your favorite stores. Here's an example. So a few weeks ago, I was at the container store because I con married the crap out of my closet. Hashtag spark joy. So when I was checking out, they asked me if I was a member of POP, their perfectly organized perks program. I said, I am not. They said, oh, it is so easy. All we need is your phone number and you will get an extra 15% off. I was like, oh, okay. Saving money is like making money. Here is my phone number. I want to be a popper like yesterday. And look, this isn't just about business either. I mean, you can use this same strategy to double your chances of getting yes, even in your own head. For example, if you've made a commitment to exercise more, which of these internal scripts is more likely to get you moving? I need to work out today. Or, I need to work out today. A five-minute dance break is better than nothing. Now, I don't know about you, but I am way more likely to get moving with that second option. Rule number 23, track your successes and stumbles. Track your successes and your stumbles. So for example, every year I do a year in review. I write down each year's successes and my stumbles, and most important, what I've learned from them all. So this way I have this very factual list of what I've accomplished and the mistakes I made along the way. And I can see that not only did those mistakes not ruin me, but they help me get stronger and they help me get better, which makes me less afraid of making more of them in the future. Rule number 24, just be yourself. When I first started as a business person, I was 23 years old and I was so insecure 
in my mind, starting a life coaching business as a 23-year-old, like the logical part of my mind was like, who the hell is going to hire a 23-year-old life coach? This is the dumbest, silliest, stupidest thing you've ever tried in your life. And I had been on Wall Street. I'd worked in the magazine industry. I'd done all these things and basically hit all these different walls. And when I was trying to figure out how to be an entrepreneur at 23, and this is like the late 90s, early 2000s. This is at the very beginning of all things digital. I felt like I didn't fit in. You know, I was trying to live into this idea of who I thought a businesswoman would be with like big shoulder pads and, you know, a corner office and tried to write an online newsletter at that time that was like uber professional and it was lifeless. I wasn't getting anywhere because I wasn't being me. And I'm just a girl from New Jersey who was brought up in a very, um, you know, kind of normal middle class way. No one in my family ever went to college. My parents, my mom especially, you know, she curses like a sailor. So I had this very unique upbringing and I was trying to fit myself into this idea of who I thought I should be and it wasn't working. So it wasn't until I actually allowed myself to just be the weird, wacky, energetic, kind of a little bit crazy person that I am that things actually started to work. And so now it's been almost 20 years of doing this and I've seen it time and time again where people tend to feel stuck and stifled, where they tend to feel like their life force is just drained out of them. There gets to be despair and depression. They just feel stuck is when they're not expressing the fullness of who they really are. They're trying to fit themselves into a conventional box. They're trying to live up to other people's expectations. They're trying to be someone who they really aren't because they're afraid that the real them is gonna get rejected. Rule number 25, create an A-plus experience. JetBlue has done something really impressive. They've taken the top spot in J.D. Power's North American Airline Satisfaction Study for 12 consecutive years. Create an A-plus experience right out of the gate. Or in this case, before the gate. Here's what I mean. When I got to the JetBlue terminal at JFK, something was different. It felt different. It was more calm and spacious, and the design had this uber intentional kind of vibe to it. There were a ton of check-in stations, like more than I'd ever seen, which meant there was no wait time for me to check myself in. There were clear directions and clear signage and more than enough JetBlue employees around if needed. Now, I would love you to think about your business. So from the very second that someone says yes to your product or your service, how can you give them this royal treatment? You know, you don't need a whole team of flight attendants, right? It could be as simple as a series of emails that welcome your customers and really make them feel taken care of and appreciated and already enticed to come back again. Rule number 26, express positive energy. The fact that your energy gets embedded into your communications, we all know that, right? Like you've received the email that's curt and you can just almost feel the punch in the face that comes through. You've gotten the text where you're like, they are definitely pissed at me. Um, I believe, and I do this a lot with email marketing, especially in our business, every time I sit down to write a new email, I want the other person who receives this email to the best of my ability to feel the love and the energy and the respect and the excitement that I have, not only for the idea that I'm about to share, but for the impact it could have on their life. I want them to feel all of me. You know, if I'm sitting there writing an email and I'm like just feeling flaccid, I mean, what's that copy gonna be like? It's not going to be any good. But if I'm there and I'm like playful and I'm excited about it, so that excitement is conveyed. And when someone's looking through their inbox and they see something from me, nine times out of 10, because I'm consistent, they know if they click open, it's going to be a good time, right? There's going to be love in that email. There's going to be an energy to that email that's different. And I mean, you've probably experienced this in your own life in simple ways. When someone makes a request of you, they care to even put an emoji because it's not just them trying. It's like that was a genuine expression of their excitement. Um, I'm sure if your wife asks you for something and her energy is such that there's love embedded in it, you're a hundred times more likely to want to say yes, right? One. 100% correct. Yes. So we all feel this stuff. And I think that if you can consciously begin to practice it, then you're going to notice the impact and the results. Rule number 27, turn envy into action. Envy can be inspiring and instructive. If you're envious of someone's results, just let that fuel you ahead. 
the fact that they did it means that it can be done and that you can do it too. So just give them a high five and a soul shake. Second, realize that envy is often a clue that there's something latent in you that needs to be expressed. So let that envy trigger you in a beautiful way. Let it guide you to where you need to take some more action in your own life. So next time, Anne, that you're feeling some envy, don't feel embarrassed. Just remember this tweetable. Don't hide your envy, ride your envy. From she has what I want to I'll have what she's having. Rule number 28, live the life you want to live. Ronnie was a palliative nurse who sat by the bedsides of the terminally ill for years, and she discovered that the number one most common regret of folks who were on their deathbed was this. I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. I gotta tell you, Every time I read that or say it, it gets me in the gut. It's one of those truths that I think is worth revisiting to make sure that we're really living the life that we want to live, not the life others expect of us. So the cue I want you to aid today actually has three parts. Part number one, what's one thing you're doing right now, not because it's true for you, but because you feel it's expected from you? Part number two, what's one courageous change you'd like to make to be more true to yourself? And part number three, what's the first action step you can take now? Now, don't just think about this in your head. I want you to leave a short comment below because it will help you actually make that change happen. Promise. Rule number 29, lift yourself up. Hey, Marie. I'm really struggling with imposter syndrome. No matter how many people tell me I'm amazing and have really helped them, no matter how much progress I make in my business and life, I still feel like it's all a fluke and I actually suck and I should give up. Most people who are high achievers feel this way but never talk about it. It's like this dirty little secret that everyone's afraid to admit. Now, I will tell you right now, I still feel this way and I've been doing what I'm doing for almost two decades. My friend friend Brene Brown says this, as a shame researcher, I know that the very best thing to do in the midst of a shame attack is totally counterintuitive. Practice courage and reach out. A to the men, Brene, and amen to you, Z, for sharing with this question. You know why? Because shame always shrivels when you share it out loud. So here's what to do to take this even further. What I want you to do is put a few people on speed dial for when that fraud festival comes to town, and it won't go away. These folks are your new hashtag fraud squad, people who you can jump on a call with and just say something like, you know, hey, guys, I'm feeling like I kind of suck right now. Can you remind me why I don't? Now, naturally, you should be willing to return the favor. You want to be that person who's always lifting others up and reminding them of how great they are, especially when they can't see it for themselves. Rule number 30, speak it, write it, be it. My question, how can I go about projecting myself as a writer first and a teacher second? What business steps can I take to make this transformation? Thank you for all you do, Christina. All right, so Christina, we got some good answers for you today. There's actually three very simple, very effective things that you can do right now to make that transformation and make it happen fast. The first one is speak it. So words have tremendous power. All you gotta do next time you find yourself at a cocktail party, just say you're a writer first. Um, So anytime you introduce yourself, talk about writing, talk about your books, talk about everything else before you start saying you're a teacher and that's gonna make a huge difference. So um, what we like to say is just do it. Just do it. Just do it, Christina. Number two, number two, you want to write it. So all language that goes out into the world, think about this. What does your email signature say? What does your business card say? What about any social media profiles? The very first thing that you should have is ding, 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 writer. So if you don't have writer as the first thing listed on all of your written paraphernalia, go and make that change right now. I'll wait. Do it. Did you just do it? Okay, good. Um, Number three, and this is the most important one of all, is be it. You have to write as much as you can. So if you don't have a blog, I would highly suggest you start blogging. Perhaps journaling will be more your thing, but just really be the writer that you actually are. And it becomes pretty simple if you're doing something habitually, you're writing every day, you're putting out blog posts, you're publishing more books. Naturally, it's gonna be the first thing that pops out of your mouth. Rule number 31, have high standards. 
One of the things about my team in particular is we do share a lot of DNA. So everyone does have very high standards. They want to be the best. They want to crush it. They want to come out with new things. They want to be innovative. They want to always be at that next level. So I can only play with people like that because they're the only people that get my kind of little weirdness and craziness. So that's number one. Number two is we're also realists and we've been in this game long enough to realize you're not going to hit a home run every single time. I always like to call it the SNL effect. Like I love SNL. I think it's a great show. I've always watched it, you know, but you don't get to dick in a box unless you actually do all of these other skits. I mean, it was one of the funniest, in my opinion, I know people are like, eh, but it was one of the funniest skits back in the day. It was hilarious. And I remember watching that thing so many times and going like, this is genius. Remember Justin Timberlake? And it was just like this whole thing. Again, in today's culture, in 2019 culture, that would get ripped apart. I'm talking about in that particular moment in time, I thought it was funny. You don't get to some of their most hilarious skits unless you produce a lot of work. So coming back to your point in terms of high standards, you can have really high standards for things, but you have to allow yourself to do a lot of volume and make mistakes. So an example was in the fall, we went out and did some things on the road that it was a new thing. And we're not using any of the footage because it wasn't very good. I'm not crying in my cereal over that. That's like part of the game. So I think it's very possible to have high standards, which is different than perfectionism, and allow yourself the grace and the space to play and experiment and fall on your face or not use stuff. Rule number 32, get ideas from everywhere. Rather than feeling like you have to strain that big, beautiful brain of yours to come up with ideas, you can literally snatch them from all around you because everyday life contains endless material. Things that you overhear, something you notice out the window, maybe it's a lyric from a song or a scene from something on TV, an interaction that you had in the line at Starbucks. Literally, content is everywhere. It's like air, but unlike air, you can snatch it. So here's an example. One day I was here in New York City and I overheard this woman on her cell phone as she walked past me. She was super upset, she was frustrated, and she said, I'm just not great with financial stuff. I just can't handle it. And yes, she was British. So immediately I whipped out my cell phone and I shot this video right here. And I talked about why it's so important that people stop telling themselves these negative stories about money. And I talked about how important it is, especially for women, to take charge of their finances. Then a couple hours later, I slapped that thing up on Facebook and boom, content snatched and hatched. Snatched and hatched. Rule number 33, follow your intuition. I studied finance in college and I remember knowing I have so much energy and I didn't see myself sitting behind a desk doing corporate finance. And I thought the only place that I could possibly thrive was on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange because there's actually no physical seats. You run around all day long. It's kind of crazy and intense and it sounded pretty awesome to me. And when I got there, I felt so grateful to actually have a job and have a good job. And it was so exciting, feeling like you're in the center of the financial universe. And when I looked at all the people around me, you know, they were making tons of money, like ridiculous amounts of money, more than I could even comprehend. But as time went on, I started to realize that they weren't happy and I wasn't happy. It was like everyone I worked with, they only looked forward to these two weeks a year that they had vacation. And I was like, this is not my life. This is not what I'm supposed to do. And this little voice inside me kept saying, this is not where you're meant to be. You're meant to do something bigger. You're meant to do something greater. But the whole problem was that little voice didn't tell me what I was supposed to be doing. It just was saying, this isn't it. So eventually it got so loud. And for me, my intuition speaks very viscerally. Like I hear things inside and it starts to get so uncomfortably physically that I have to make a move. And I finally um, found myself one day so miserable, I felt like I was gonna cry. And I had to actually leave the floor. And I walked out and um, right near Wall Street, there's Trinity Church. And um, I was raised Catholic and so I saw the church and I was like, I have to go to the church. And I sat on the steps and I pulled out my cell phone. I called my parents and I was crying my eyes out. I felt like such a loser because I grew up in a very middle class family. My parents busted their buns to put me through school. And here I was having this safe and secure job for all intents and purposes, an amazing job and I wanted to quit and I didn't know what I wanted to do. And so I just told them I don't want to you know, be a failure, but I can't do this anymore. My dad said something so powerful to me, I will never forget it. He said, 
don't worry about the money. He's like, you have to figure out what you love. If you figure out something that you love to do, everything else is gonna take care of itself. So if you've gotta quit, quit, and everything will work out. And I remember I walked back into the floor and I like had to you know, wipe my face and um, that was the beginning of the end. I think within like two weeks I gave my notice and I had to leave. Rule number 34, exercise. When I take a spin class, a really good spin class where I'm loving the music and I can absolutely let go and charge into my body, I can like feel into every single movement. I can let the sweat pour off of me. I can get lost in the, in the rhythm. I find that it opens up a channel in me like nothing else. Sometimes it could be taking a great walk. I think- I, I wanna push you a little bit on yeah. opens the channel so I really understand it. Yes. Is it where you feel like you can hear the little voice in your mind? Is it where you're- Ironically, you can't try and force it to show up. So oftentimes when I hit a roadblock in my business and I'm just at this stalemate, and I'm like, oh, I can go this way or this way. I'm stuck. Let me go work out. Let me go take a walk. Let me take a spin class. Let me take a dance class and get immersed in that so that my subconscious and the rest of my body has a chance to work through it and it will produce an answer or an insight when I'm not looking for it. It could happen at the end of the class, when I'm done in the shower, sometimes it happens on the bike, it doesn't matter. But what you just have to do is have a level of faith and trust and you can't go in forcing it. I feel like what happens through exercise, and again, it's when you have that level of faith to surrender to your body, to surrender that you have wisdom within you that you're not gonna access grinding to it, it unfurls almost like a flower blooms when it's ready. Rule number 35, be consistent. As someone who's been consistently creating content and sharing content for almost two decades now, I speak from experience. And I gotta tell you, being consistent with your content creation, it is so important. It's actually one of the biggest factors in our company's success. So when it comes to coming up with things to write about or talk about or teach about, I really do believe that I can never run out of ideas because literally there's always more where that came from. Look people, we live in an abundant, ever-changing, ever-expanding universe. It's literally impossible to run out of ideas, I promise you. Now, this doesn't mean that I never feel like I run out of ideas or that I don't occasionally wonder if I'm tapped out. I mean, believe me, I have those moments. But when that happens, I remember my magical mantra that there's always more where that came from and it changes everything like that because there's always another story to tell. There's always another way for me to serve. There's always someone who could use a helping hand or a kind word or a reminder about how freaking great they are. And from that space, ideas always, always come. Rule number 36, go the extra mile. Wherever you are on the plane, JetBlue has really given thought to the details, and I love this. So, for example, free Wi-Fi. And I know it sounds silly, but so many damn flights that I've taken make me pay this extra 25 or 30 bucks just to get work done when I've already paid a shit ton of money to fly. So free Wi-Fi for the entire plane? I gotta say, that's a nice perk when we're all so used to being nickel and dimed. Next, I gotta talk about snacks. So on longer flights, they have this self-service snack situation in the economy cabin, which is so humane. And I have to tell you that in Mint, which is their business class that I fly because I mean business, Brett, my fantastic, super cool flight attendant, brought me this refreshing lime mint spritzer. I was so impressed with that beverage branding. Flying in mint class and getting a mint drink, nicely done. And last but not least, Brett also called me by my first name, Marie, instead of Miss Forleo. Now, of course, he could have called me Forleo, and I would have been down for that. But who doesn't want to hear their first name? And he kept calling me by my first name throughout the entire flight. It was kind, it was friendly, and it gave me the sense that he actually cared about me. So what I want you to do is think about all the little details in your business. Where and how can you go the extra mile for your people? What can you do to make people just feel that things are more personable and thoughtful? Rule number 37, embrace femininity. Culturally speaking, we've mostly been taught that the feminine is weak, right? That's why so many women man up to run a business. For me, for years and years and years, it produced incredible results, but you know what? At a tremendous cost. Where I felt myself 
and my creativity starting to just drain down, where I felt myself getting more and more stressed, less and less joyful, where I found myself feeling more and more tired and asking the questions, why? Because I know my core essence. So that is one of probably the biggest mistaken notions that we have culturally is that the feminine is weak and it is not. It is one of the most beautiful, powerful forces within all of us. And I think, and I'll speak particularly to the women who are watching right now, one of the most profound things that you can do over the course of your life, especially if you struggle with being in your feminine, is to understand that it will unlock your most powerful, beautiful, creative life that you could imagine, which includes your ability to kick major ass in business, and it includes your ability to heal others. Rule number 38, get a go-to mantra. Get a go-to mantra. So this strategy involves making up just this little phrase that you can say to yourself in those clutch moments, either when you're about to go into a big meeting or when you just need to sit down and do your work. Mindy Kaling, whom I love, suggested this as a motto. Why the f*** not me? And she's got the book to back it up. Now, I have to say, I've got my own version that I pull out when I need it every once in a while, too. You're Marie f***ing Forleo. You got this, bitch. Okay. Say it back. You're Marie f***ing Forleo. You got this, bitch. Yeah, you do. Chest bump. Now, a little science note here. When it comes to motivational self-talk, research shows that talking to yourself in the third person can help you actually feel less anxiety and perform better. So get yourself a go-to mantra and some bonus points if you use your first name. Rule number 39, serve. If you've got all your attention on yourself thinking, well, what's going to generate a whole bunch of likes? Or what's going to get people talking about me? Or what's going to make me more famous? Or me more relevant? Or me more popular? You are thinking about content creation in the wrong damn way. Because whether you realize it or not, you're prioritizing self-importance over being of service. You're thinking about what you can get versus what you can give, which is always a losing proposition. This is especially true on social. When you're locked into what I call the me, me, me mind, that's a guaranteed way to make sure that you feel desperate, anxious, and unworthy. And I don't know anybody who can come up with great content ideas when they're feeling desperate, anxious, or unworthy. Do you? Of course not. Rule number 40, try many things. I was always into a lot of different things. I had a ton of energy. I remember um, I would make up dances with my friends and like choreograph stuff in the living room and then I would go and I remember actually having Encyclopedia Britannica and like copying it down and like rewriting the content and making new pictures and creating things. Um, so as a little girl, I was always wanting to learn new things, do new things and create stuff. Um, you know, I was a cheerleader, so I was, and by the way, I wasn't a cheerleader for a while. I got rejected so many times. I tried out, I can't even tell you, I would practice in my living room. I'd put the video camera up to try and like figure out why my arm wasn't straight enough. But um, I always just wanted to express myself in all these different ways. And when, you know, my parents kept these great books of when I was little where you kind of record what your kids want and what they're into and all those things. And I remember in the section where it says, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? It was always five to seven things. It was never just one thing and they were all completely different. It was like from dancer to teacher, to model, to actress, to writer, like all these different kind of professions that sounded fascinating to me. Um, so that was me when I was little, I was all over the place. Rule number 41, focus on the long game. I'm always focused on the long game. I think these days, a lot of people want Insta results. They want to be Instagram famous. They want to have like a billion dollar business overnight. And if you're just starting out, you've never run a business, you've never created content, you've never sold, marketed, built a team, done any of these things before, to expect instant results, it's immature. It's unrealistic. You're never gonna get there. And some of the people I admire most in the world, no matter what their craft is, dude, they're in it for the long game. They're not sitting around going like, you know, why can't I get higher conversions by tomorrow? It's like, that's not how this works, man. And if you're looking for that type of 
result. It's just like, I'm not interested in hanging with those kind of people. I think we get better over time. I think you have to really be patient. I think people have to understand, especially when it comes to any so-called like glamorous type career or people, maybe things that people perceive are glamorous, whether it's something like what you and I do, an athlete, an entertainer. Do you know what 90% of the work is? Grunt work. That's what it is. It's unglamorous. Sometimes people are like, I want to see what you do more. I'm like, you want to see what I do more? I'm sitting with a messy bun in my sweatpants, sometimes not showering for three goddamn days because I'm hammering shit out. That's what I do. I love it. But if you're not willing to put in that kind of work, you're not going to get the outcomes on the other side. Rule number 42, make sacrifices. I work so hard to get my business off the ground and I was often working seven days a week, yeah. you know, not just coaching, like that was a portion of what I did, but to keep a roof over my head, it was bartending, it was waiting tables, it was like being a personal assistant, cleaning mm -hmm. people's toilets, whatever I needed to do mm -hmm. in order to pay my rent, you know, put food on the table right. and actually continue to grow the business. So I basically developed a habit of working nonstop. And Before one, Marie TV. Oh yeah, 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 like getting the business off the ground. Like yeah, yeah. I worked side you were like gigs. Like a fitness coach, you did like dance instruction, you did everything. I was yeah. a Nike elite dance athlete. I, you know, taught anywhere from like three to seven classes a week at Crunch Fitness. Some of them were choreographed, some of them were basic fitness. I had the coaching clients, I was doing the content, wow. and I was bartending and waiting tables. So I had developed this habit of nonstop work because that was what was necessary at that time. In New York. Yes. Yeah. Rule number 43, try everything. Everyone asks us from the time that we're like in our kind of mid-teens and when you start thinking about, you know, what you're gonna major in and where you're gonna go to college and what you're gonna do, it's like, what do you wanna do when you grow up? And it's this question that I think is really intimidating. First of all, because when we're young, we might not have that answer yet. And in my case, there were a lot of things that I wanted to do. I remember having such a passion for dance, although I never took any formal dance training until I was like in my mid 20s. I loved dance. I was passionate about fitness and health. I loved spirituality. I loved reading. I loved business. I actually thought at one point I was going to be an animator for Disney. So I think that part of my own challenge and my struggle was that most of the world was telling me that I had to pick one thing. And all this conventional wisdom was like, if you're gonna be a success, you have to narrow down, pick one thing, specialize in it, and be the best at that thing, and maybe in like 10 or 20 years, you're gonna be awesome. And every time I tried to follow that conventional wisdom that told me to pick one thing, I felt like I was cutting off a limb. Even when I you know, tried to just pick life coaching, and I was like, I'm just gonna be a life coach, I felt horrible. I felt terrible when I decided that I was actually gonna give dance, which was hip hop dance and, and fitness a go, thinking like, okay, I'm just supposed to do this. Just doing that, I felt terrible thinking I was putting life coaching on the back burner. And it wasn't until I realized that I am a multi-passionate person, I am multifaceted. There are a lot of things that I'm not only interested in, but I'm actually good at, and I need to give myself permission to do everything and just run away from the conventional wisdom, that's actually when I started feeling good about myself, and that's when I actually started getting traction in the world. And when I say traction, I mean started getting better projects, started getting paid more, started actually building skills that now are crucial for my business. Rule number 44, start small. And vision is great. Some people have amazing, huge, big, grand visions, and they love it, and they step into it, and they rise up to that occasion, and that's awesome. Like, if that's you, and that's how you're built, and that's what works for you, rock on. For many people, when they have an enormous vision, it paralyzes them. They have no idea how to accomplish it. I see people cry in workshops all the time. It's so big, I don't know how to do it. I wanna change the world. I'm like, don't worry about changing the world, change one person's life. If we can focus there, stay there for a little bit, we're gonna to get to that thing, maybe. Otherwise, it's all good because you're still doing the work that you were born to do. Rule number 45, use your customer's language. As I approached the gate, I knew I needed to get some work done before hopping on that flight. And I was bracing to try and find one of those like long vertical outlet hubs where there's 30 people clustered around trying to plug their stuff in. So to my very pleasant surprise, I found rows and rows and rows of these comfortable, cute little workstations, all with their own outlets, and a huge sign above it that said, the juice bar. I mean, seriously, how many times have you said to yourself, oh crap, 
I ran out of juice on my phone or my computer has zero juice. I need to go find a plug. So when JetBlue says juice bar, they are speaking my language. And it's a very smart play on words that lets me know, hey, they get me. And I got to tell you this, every single customer wants to feel like you as a business owner, just get them. Now, another quick example, uh, when I saw the help desk, right, instead of saying something formal like information desk, the sign said, just ask. So not only is the latter more friendly and inviting, but it implies that my question is welcome and not stupid. So the bottom line is this, using your customer's language is key if you want to create more sales and raving fans. And in the words of this tweetable, your customer's language is the jet fuel to make your business take off. Rule number 46, be humble. The most accomplished and respected people in the world stay humble. They're curious, they're open-hearted, they're lifelong learners. Don't ever feel like you have to overcompensate for imposter syndrome by becoming an arrogant asshat know-it-all. Not only do you not have to know it all, but you become extra trustworthy when you say these three magic words, I don't know. You know, I consider myself a forever student, and I happily admit when I have no idea what something is or how to do something. But you know what? Everything is figure outable. So not knowing doesn't make me a fraud, and it doesn't have to make you one either. Rule number 47, take control of your life. I was bartending at night, waiting tables, doing assistant work. Like I was basically working 24 seven, you know, in the evenings and weekends, it was all, how can I just make money to pay my rent and put food on the table? And in the days I was really working my buns off, trying to create content, create a newsletter, get coaching clients, actually start working with people. And, um, when I got engaged really young, I was about 23 years old and the guy was a sweetheart, but I realized pretty quickly, I didn't want to marry him. This was not the person I was meant to spend the rest of my life with, but we lived in this tiny one room studio in the West Village and our money was already co-mingled. And so I was terrified because I felt like I made this huge mistake. Here I am trying to become a life coach and clearly I have a lot to figure out about life. Um, I knew I needed to get out of this relationship, but I didn't I didn't know how to untangle what I had created, this big mess. And so um, I knew once I broke off that engagement, I needed to actually physically leave that environment. That was the only way I was gonna get to move on. And so I called my parents in New Jersey and I said, I I hate to say this, but I have to move home. I was so upset. I just felt like a total failure. I felt like a horrible person for breaking this guy's heart. And it was just, it was a mess. Like I just felt like such a failure on every single level. The fact that I couldn't support myself yet, the fact that I had to go back to Jersey, the fact that I felt like I, you know, did a number on this guy's life. And um, it was really humbling. But, you know, uh, at the end of that, it made me realize I'm more committed than ever to figure out what it takes to make my life work and then also to be able to share those lessons with other people. So hopefully they didn't have to go through (laughs) the mess that I created. If I could save people a learning curve, that was gonna be awesome. And I think I was home maybe like two or three months, something like that. Emotionally I had to heal and just kind of get myself resituated and you know, find a new living, um, a place to live in the city and get back on my feet. But it was probably one of the best things that ever happened to me because it got me regrounded in my own power and made me realize that if everything falls apart, which it sometimes does, there's always a way to get back on your feet. Rule number 48, take action now. Indecision is a dream killer. And the opposite, what do we do about that? It's probably one of the things I live my life by most besides the idea that everything is figure outable, is that clarity comes from, yes. Cannot wait for that. Yes, we'll talk about that. That clarity comes from engagement, not thought. So one of the things that got me off my ass, right? When I was thinking about, should I be a dancer? Could I be a dancer? Am I too old to be a dancer? Oh, I think I am. Was just getting into that friggin' dance class. That's what cracked me open to a whole additional career that, by the way, built the skill sets to what I do today. So my little kind of offshoot, my weird dancing thing, got me experience in front of the camera, teaching to big groups, leading, music, all the stuff that we've talked about in this entire interview built this incredible skill set that now fuels the brand that I have today that's completely unique that would have been sh- if I just stayed narrow and focused on life coaching. I would have been, you know, that girl with like an awful pink suit and shoulder pads 
terrible. Rule number 49, don't stress yourself. What's the biggest lesson you've learned in the last decade for you? That things, first of all, keep getting better. Mm. I think in our society, especially as for at least to, um, you know, as you get older, at least in my family, there was mm. a lot of kind of cultural expectations like, oh, over this age, it kind of starts going down. Or you know what I mean? You're kind of, you peak when you're young and that's when all the good stuff happens. And for me, I feel like it keeps getting better. And I love that the best years are still ahead of me. Mm. And that all the stuff that mm. I've been through, there's like all of these exciting new possibilities. So that's one of the biggest lessons. And I think the other one is that I don't have to stress as hard. like. As a human being, I have a really strong work ethic, mm -hmm. but I also tend to put a lot of pressure on myself. And the other lesson I've learned is that I don't need to do that, that the work actually gets done more joyfully and more creatively yeah. if I don't add on that additional layer of pressure and stress. And rule number 50, the last one before a very special bonus clip, is be true to who you are. I'd love to hear about kind of being a media maker and kind of the thought you put into kind of the message you want to show people. Yeah, that's actually been a really um, interesting evolution because I am naturally a super goofy person. I'm naturally sometimes an inappropriate person. There's things that pop out of my mouth as being a person from Jersey that other people would say, you cannot say that on stage. You should not be talking about that as a professional woman. I'm like, but that's real. And when I have meetings with other people that aren't on camera, that there's no recording device around, that's actually how they talk too. So why are we separating ourselves to be like this very one type of person when we feel like we're out in public and then in private we act a completely different way? I just think that's so hypocritical. And so for me, I feel like also the, the way that I best express myself is when I'm not trying to be anything other than who I actually am and how I would talk to my friends. You know, it's been interesting too with Marie TV. It's like, I'm a woman who enjoys clothes and I'm a woman who enjoys like sometimes it's sassy and sexy clothing and sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's very, um, you know, there's boxy things that I want to wear and sometimes it's really casual and sometimes it's a little bit more elegant, but those are all sides of me. And so it's been interesting because sometimes I'll put something on, I'm like, mm, there's a little too much skin. Am I sending the wrong message to young women? Uh, but then I also have another voice in my head that says, but you know what? I actually like this dress and it makes me feel good and I feel confident. So I think it's it's something that I don't feel like I have perfectly figured out, but it's certainly a conversation that is very relevant. It's very present in my mind. It's very present for our team because what we wanna do is create media that first of all, the content is really impactful. And second of all, that we're being true to who we are and for me being true to who I am. And third of all, um, giving young women a different and diverse look at what it means to be successful, what it means to be yourself, and that you can show different sides of you and be taken seriously. Now I have a special bonus clip from Marie on how to start a hype file that I think you're gonna enjoy. But before that, it's time for the three point landing questions. Let's go from just watching a video to taking action. Here we go. Question number one, where do you need to just start taking action now? Number two, what is your intuition telling you that you need to follow? And number three, what can you do every morning to lift yourself up? And if you made it this far in the video, I wanna celebrate you. Give me a hashtag believe down in the comments as well. Start a hype file. Now you may have heard of a swipe file and I'm suggesting that you start a hype file. This is a place where you can keep a running list of compliments and thank yous and any comments from people who've shared how you've helped them. So the next time you're feeling like a fraud, all I want you to do is open up that hype file. Marie is a living miracle. If loving Marie is wrong, I don't wanna be right. Marie, best show ever. I got your logo tattooed on my You inspired me to start a business. You inspired me to start 10 businesses. And let them remind you that yes, you are the real deal. If you wanna see the top 10 I did on Mel Robbins, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. Whenever you start feeling in your life like, oh my gosh, is this all there is? Huge red flag number one. You know, I've heard a lot of experts say 